Well, even as we sing with great joy these songs, I am reminded that there are fewer, more debated topics in the church, for better or worse, than the topic of music, right? Instruments or no instruments, loud or soft, ancient hymns or modern choruses, band or choir, drums, here we go, drums or no drums. And of course, many of, of those questions are clearly false dichotomies. You know, so many of our discussions on music in the church are not a simple dogmatic either or, but, but more to the point, and regardless of your opinion on intelligent lighting and fog machines, I, I do think that, that many of our discussions around music in the local church unfortunately just happen at this kind of surface level. So before we start thinking about instrumentation and style and the perfect decibel level, I think it's really important that the people of God think both biblically and theologically about music. If you've been around at all this summer, you know that we're in the middle of a series in biblical theology called From Old to New to You. And today, hold on to your seat uh, because we are going to attempt to build a biblical theology of music and singing. And for those of you just straight away who might be tempted to be checking out at this point in the sermon, just, just let me give you the, the eloquent, unedited words of our man Martin Luther who says, I have no use for cranks who despise music. Because he says it's a gift of God. This is interesting, Martin Luther speaking. He says, next, after theology, I give to music the highest place and the greatest honor. So there is a lot at stake in this conversation, but, but what is that deeper biblical purpose for singing across the scope of redemption history from Genesis to Revelation? What are the, the deep theological underpinnings surrounding music and singing? And, and furthermore, how do we then bring those timeless truths forward into to this space today for contemporary application and implications. And, and it's with those questions in mind that we begin our journey this morning by exploring what we might call the songs of old. The songs of the Old Testament given to responding to and remembering God's character and works. The songs of the Old Testament serve as both a response to God and a remembrance of God. And, and one of the first and most compelling examples comes from Exodus 15. So if you would, take your Bibles and, and turn to Exodus 15. We'll be all over the scriptures today. I'll only have you turn to a couple of places. I don't wanna give your fingers too much of a workout. Uh, but Exodus 15. And as you, you turn there, just a little reminder of some context. At this point in redemption history, the people of God have been oppressed, they have been abused, and they have been enslaved for hundreds of years. They cry out to God in faith, and by his mercy, he hears them, and he delivers them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Most of you know the story. And so having just crossed through the Red Sea, we read in Exodus 15, we'll move around a little bit, beginning in verse one. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. Verse four, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. Verse six, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. 
The song goes on in great detail. You can just see it by looking at it in the text, how long it is to describe all the particularities of this deliverance, and it ends with a crescendo in verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. This is just one example of the purpose of singing, the deeper purpose of singing, responding to God and remembering what he has done. Another example uh, of the songs of old comes from Judges chapter five. God has just subdued another king, the king of Canaan, before the people of God, and in response, we get a duet, actually, one that dwarfs even the great Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, you might say. Uh, Judges chapter five, then sang Deborah and Barak, that the leaders took the lead in Israel and that the people offered themselves willingly Bless the Lord. Hear, kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord, and I will sing, I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Another very long, very detailed song. It goes on in verse 24, interestingly, to say this. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite, of the tent-dwelling women most blessed. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still, there he fell, dead. Wait, what? Only the... Only the book of Judges could give us this. I mean, can you imagine the tune? Took up the tent peg, drove it through his head, then he fell, he sank, now he's dead. <laughs> like, what? This is a song. Like, what, what is going on here? And what is going on is that God's people throughout the Old Testament are singing history. More specifically, they're, they're singing redemption history. They are detailing every aspect of God's saving work. They're responding and they're remembering. We could give so many other examples from the Old Testament narrative and historical books, but, but moving along, our next stop is what we might call the greatest album ever written. I apologize to Beatles fans. It is not Abbey Road. Great album, to be sure but we're talking about the book of Psalms and we might describe this, the greatest of albums as the full human experience, the full human experience with God at the center. John Calvin says of the Psalms, what various and resplendent riches are contained in this treasury. I have been wont to call this book, Calvin says, an anatomy of all parts of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as a mirror. And there are a lot of ways to investigate and to survey this incredible songbook. We're gonna take a look at just a handful of some of the major categories, beginning with what we might call Psalms of Thanksgiving. One of many examples comes from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from troubled and gathered in from the lands, the east, the west, the north, and the south. So in Psalm 107, the, the psalmist begins with a call to give thanks. And, and, and notice if you heard where he roots that call. For he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. He then gets even more specific and talks about God's work of gathering his people together. So again, the psalm of thanksgiving is a response to the character and the saving work of God. Next, we have psalms of petition, psalms like 61, which says, hear my cry, O Lord. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. 
for you have been my refuge in a strong tower against the enemy. The psalmist is petitioning, he's pleading with God for help. And again, he roots it in this deep theology of God's character and work. We keep coming back to that. For you have been a refuge, a strong tower. This is why I can call out to you for help. I know who you are. I know what you've done. Psalms of petition, they, they, they put us in a position of need before God and they appeal to him in his great strength and mercy. Then there's this category of psalms called, called psalms of kingship. Psalm 72 is an example. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May he defend the cause of the poor, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. Now these kingship psalms, of course, have a historical, cultural context, very often associated with David and David's line. But others, like, like Psalm 72, also point even further into the future, standing on God's covenant promise to David of a coming eternal kingdom where, where one of his own line would, would rule, would come the promised Messiah king and usher in God's kingdom of eternal righteousness and peace. Another hugely important and sadly sometimes neglected category of the Psalms are the Psalms of lament. Psalm 44 is an example. Hear God's word which says, awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, don't reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. And our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Psalms of lament are so true to life. They reach down, deep down, into the innermost parts and pain of, of the human experience. They're a deep cry to God for help. They're even a platform for, for grief and even complaint. They press the singer toward a deep dependence on God and very often, and interestingly, the psalms of lament often end in praise. And that is actually the last category that we'll explore, the psalms of praise. The final few psalms really hit this well. Psalm 150, the last song in the book, says praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Here is a call for a glorious anthem to, to publicly and to joyfully declare the character and works of God because in the end, through the full scope of the human experience, the Psalms tell us that in the end, he is worthy. And Friends, there are, are so many more categories and songs that, that we could explore, but even just this quick survey helps us to, to formulate and to put together a more defined biblical theology of music and singing. In fact, we might say it this way, that singing is an instrument of our praise to God and our proclamation of God. Singing is an instrument of our praise to God and our proclamation of God. Singing is a response to God. And it's a means, it's a mechanism by which God's people remember who he is and all that he has done for us. Matthew Westerholm is a, a professor out at Southern Seminary, a professor of church music, and, and he tells what is a remarkable story about his 97-year-old grandmother who at, at this point in her life had suffered pr 
pretty significant memory loss. The, the, the memory loss was so severe that, that whenever the family would visit, they would very often have to reintroduce themselves. And, and he recalls one specific visit where he was there with his children and his dad was there. And, and his dad introduced himself. He said, he said, I'm your son, John. And she, wide-eyed, looked across the table from him and she said, I, I had you? And yet, Westerholm says the ravages of memory loss somehow missed the part of her mind that held hymn lyrics and melodies so near. So whenever the family would, would sing hymns together, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arm. This remarkable woman would in that moment slide into the perfect alto and she would sing. She even sang the callback, leaning, leaning on. Nobody knows that part. Nobody ever sings that part correctly, but she had it. And it was almost as if the Lord had etched in her mind in slow motion over a lifetime of singing an impenetrable remembrance of who God was and what he had done for her. Singing really is an instrument of our praise to God and our proclamation of God. So we come to the end of the Psalms. And Psalm 150 exclaims, the final verse, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And yet, on the, the, the historical timeline of the Old Testament, we come to a period of, of, of kind of relative silence and even uncertainty. The final prophets had spoken, right? Rome had emerged as the cultural, political superpower of Palestine and, and beyond. And there were a lot of questions, right? The people of God were a long way from the glory and splendor of David's kingdom. So what would God do next? For that, I invite you to turn over to Luke chapter one. As we bridge over into the New Testament, Luke chapter one. And in the beginning of Luke's gospel account, we hear a young teenage girl singing one of the first, and actually one of the only songs in the entire New Testament, and it is powerful. Luke chapter one, verse 46, and Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked on the humblest state of his servant for behold from now and on all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Verse 54 he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. Now, what could cause this full-throated outburst of praise from this young Jewish girl? Well, just before she sang, you might even leaf back a page and peek at it in verse 30. The angel Gabriel comes to her and he says, Mary, don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And then in verse 32 we hear it. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is it. The king has finally come. 
The anticipation, the waiting, the long-awaited kingdom of righteousness and peace has finally broken through. And because singing is an instrument of our praise to God and our proclamation of, of, of God, Mary just lets it rip. She sings because the King, the Messiah, has finally, finally come. But of course, in the gospel, we have a twist. Because God did not send this king to establish just another ordinary earthly kingdom. He didn't send this king to provide material blessing or political advancement or so that Israel could win more gold medals than any other country. This king was sent to accomplish something much, much greater. The eternal salvation and deliverance of the people of God. This, this king was sent to live in the full scope of the human experience, right? The same full scope that we observed and felt in the Psalms. And ultimately, this king was sent to die. And in the few recorded words that we have from Jesus on the cross, he quotes a Psalm. Psalm 22, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would he say that? Because in that moment, on the cross, Jesus is bearing the full punishment for the sin of humanity. He is bearing the, the full weight of God's righteous anger. And in his death, Jesus provides the greatest deliverance and salvation that God's people would ever know. Greater than the Exodus that produced the song of Moses. Greater than the victory over the Canaanites which produced the song of Deborah. Do you see that, that Jesus' sacrificial death and subsequently, his powerful resurrection is the crescendo of God's magnum opus. He is the fullest expression of God's character and works. And as such, the person and work of Jesus become the crescendo of our song. Right? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And I just have to say, if you have, have never known the hope and the strength that come from knowing Jesus, I would implore you to, to consider him today. Consider his life and his death and, and his resurrection and the validity and implications of those things. Consider your own sin and, and your own moral culpability before a perfect and holy God and consider, consider turning to Jesus in faith. Because in turning to Jesus, in putting your trust in him, God will forgive your sin. He will give you a new life and he will put a new song in your mouth. So we've got Jesus as, as the crescendo of redemption history, but we still have some important questions on the table. One namely, how does this biblical theology of singing work its way out through the rest of the New Testament? And it's an important question because curiously, the rest of the New Testament doesn't have all that much to say about music. There's only a couple of places, but where there is clarity, we might summarize these New Testament hits as dwelling with the word and encouraging one another. Dwelling with the word of God and encouraging the people of God. We'll take a look at these two passages. The first is Colossians 3 in verse 16, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so we gotta get into the construction here of Paul's admonishment because it's both fascinating and important. He says, let the word of Christ, the word of the gospel, dwell in you richly, full stop. Like that's the controlling imperative. But then he tells them how to do it. Teaching and singing. 
In other words, let the word of Christ dwell in you, among you, the church, richly, by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This means, and this is hugely important, by the way, that singing is actually a ministry of the word. It's a ministry of the word. I just love how Dietrich Bonhoeffer, an accomplished musician himself, by the way, says it. He asked the question, why do Christians sing when they're together? The reason is, quite simply, because in singing together, it is possible for them to speak and to pray the same word at the same time. In other words, because here they can unite in the word, and thus the music is servant to the word. The second passage, the only other place in the New Testament that speaks specifically about singing is found in Ephesians 5, which says, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see that singing is a characteristic of a spirit-filled life. You wanna be a spirit-filled person? Sing. (laughs) We also see that, that melodies are to be made both to the Lord and to one another, right? Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And this is really interesting because we often think about musical praise and singing in terms of a a vertical exchange, right? Us to God. And this is right, of course, but but there's more to it. The, The fullness of biblical praise is vertical and it's horizontal. We sing to God and we sing to one another, right? Because singing is an instrument of our praise to God and our proclamation of God to one another. And so with that, we think about this survey that we've done, right? We've explored the Old Testament and the New. We have to ask a final question. How does this biblical theology of music and singing translate to us today? Right, this is the question. And having spent some time in music ministry over the years and having made a whole lot of mistakes and seen a lot of things, here are a handful of what we might call modern implications for this biblical theology of music and singing. Implication number one, the songs that that we choose to sing in church are important and intentional. You know, you can learn You really can. You can learn a great deal about a church by the songs that it sings. Its theology, its ministry priorities, what it values, what it doesn't value. I once heard Keith Getty ask, if the only thing that your congregation had as a resource were the lyrics of its songs, what kind of God would they know? What kind of gospel would they proclaim? So the songs we choose are super important and that leads to implication number two and that's that in the church, style is servant to substance. Style is servant to substance. Now, style is not unimportant. It's not. Every congregation needs to to work on finding its corporate voice and a, a unified expression of singing. And this takes patience, a lot of patience, and a lot of persistence. But that stylistic expression, whatever it is, must always be servant to the substance. And this means singing songs that are rich in theology that are replete with the attributes of God. It means singing the gospel itself. Implication number three, singing should engage both the mind and the affections. And all this talk about singing rich theology might have you tempted to think that that singing is only an activity of the mind, but, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, 
If we root our affections in biblical substance, this will actually produce in us a more fruitful, more robust, longer lasting, God-centered kind of affection. Author Philip Percival says it really well. He says, the Bible's concern is, it's not about how much or how little we show our emotions. It's not about whether arms should be up or down or if there should be clapping or reverent silence. The issue, he says, is whether our affections are captivated by the gospel. Implication number four. Instrumental music should promote the congregational voice. Now, I I wish we had the time, but we don't, to talk through all of the nuances and the beauties of of instrumental music or using it in the church gathering. Just for what it's worth, I think instrumental music can absolutely be enjoyed to the glory of God as a gift of his common grace in the same way that art and food and culture and so many other things can. But that said, in the congregational setting, in, in meetings like this, The congregational voice, all of you, have the priority. And this has huge implications, right? Everything from song selection. Is this song accessible to the average congregational singer? To supporting instrumentation. You know, how will will this particular arrangement support and prop up congregational singing? Should we have the lights on or off? If we have them off, how are we gonna see each other? And if we can't see each other, how are we gonna sing to one another? So you see how all of this matters. The congregational voice and expression is what matters most. Implication number five, music and worship are not synonymous terms. You might have noticed I've pretty much avoided using the word worship in this whole sermon. And it's not because I'm trying to play some kind of legalistic word games, but words matter. And and worship, biblical worship, is our whole life deference to and obedience to God, right? Like Romans 12 kind of stuff. And so singing in its proper place is an expression of worship, but it is not worship in all of its glory. Implication number six, um, I'm gonna start meddling here, but we're almost done so I can run out quickly. Um, singing, Singing is not a subtle suggestion, it is a clear command. Christian brother or sister, especially brother, singing is not just for the people on the platform. It's not just for the people who sang in their high school choir. Listen, I see, I spent years watching some of y'all out there when we sing. (laughs) The really good one is when we're we're singing one of your favorite hymns and somebody's letting it rip and sings my soul. And then one of those new song comes on and it's back to. Oh, you just lost your voice all of a sudden. Is that what happened? Just immediate, instant laryngitis. Listen, I know some of you will say to me, Pastor, trust me, you don't want me to sing. I've heard it, I've heard it all y'all, but I do. I do because because I want to see you mature in Christ. I, I want you to show God all of the honor and glory that he deserves. And, and I want you to experience the joys of obedience in singing. If you don't know how to sing, I'm sure Pastor Reggie would love a long line of people to teach how to sing. <laughs> Implication seven. Don't get me started, we gotta, get, get, we gotta move on. Implication seven, the songs of the saints are a deep resource for your Christian life. The psalms, the songs that we sing together on Sunday morning are a treasure trove for your life. Listen, there is, there is a song of deliverance for every temptation, there is a lament for every injustice, there is a chorus of encouragement for every weary moment. So use them, sing them to yourself, and to others, and that leads us to the final implication, number eight, that singing is a corporate 
affair. It's a family matter. Listen, I, I am imploring you today to lift your voice to the Lord in song, not just because he commands it, which would be enough, but because the brothers and sisters around you need it. They need your voice. Someone needs you to look across the room and say to them, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. And that means you too. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Listen, uh, singing in the church is not, at least primarily, about you getting lost with Jesus. It's not. It's not, at least primarily, about my time with Jesus. The church, beloved, by its nature and definition, is about us. It's about the gathering of God's redeemed people and when we come together, it's about loving and serving and building up and thinking about the other and singing is one of the ways that we can do just that. Revelation chapter five and we'll conclude here. (laughs) Revelation five gives us one of the most compelling images and powerful choruses in all the scripture and I wonder if you might just take a breath And in your mind's eye, think about what's happening here. Just listen and imagine. Revelation 5. In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And when he had taken the scroll, The four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then I looked and I heard around the throne the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That is an example that singing is an instrument of our praise to God and our proclamation, our declaration of God. And in the end, the song of the saints, even you, will be the blessing and honor and glory of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will forgive us for being lax in the singing of our praises to you, for you are worthy. Forgive us for our pride. Forgive us for our stubbornness. Forgive us for our selfishness. Lord, may we show you the deference and the glory and the honor that you deserve. Lord, forgive us for Uh, the times when we have thought only superficially about the idea of music and singing. I pray that our time in your word today would elevate this ministry in our minds and in our hearts. I pray that you'd help us to grow in our participation. I I pray for the, the brothers and sisters who in all sincerity just aren't sure what to do with this because maybe they don't have a great voice or maybe they don't like singing. I pray that you'll help them. 
And I pray that you will move and inspire them. Perhaps it's just to start by speaking the words that we're singing and then by catching a note here or there and help us as a congregation to look ahead to the days of Revelation 5 when with all of the heavenly hosts we will join in the proclamation worthy, worthy is the lamb who is slain. To him who sits on the throne be all glory and honor forever. Amen.